Welcome to Menopause, Marriage and Motherhood, a podcast that's all about changing the way we view midlife and bringing the conversation about menopause out into the open. Each week we share stories, experiences and inspiration. We talk to experts on how to best navigate this time of life and find out how other people have not only survived but thrived through this time. I'm your host, Karen O'Connor. Hello and welcome to this week's episode. I'm really excited. I'm here today with Dr. Thomas Jordan. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Karen. You, I'm so excited about this because you're a clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst in New York City, mm-hmm. and you're on the faculty of NYU's postdoctoral program in psychoanalysis, and you specialize in... Oh, what can I call it? Love in relation, love relationships. That's the best way of putting uh-huh. it, isn't yeah. it? The yeah. unhealthy and, love life. Yes, yes. But what I like, I'm, I was just reading through all your stuff and I could see your book behind you there, Learn to Love. I was looking through that. And the way you come at this, I find really fascinating. Just give me a little bit of background information on what it is you do and what you specialize in. And then we'll go from there because I've got lots of questions. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a clinical psychologist, psychoanalyst, interpersonally oriented, meaning I work a lot with relationships and such. I've been in practice here in New York City for 34 years. I work mostly individual to individual and I... Uh, I work on a host of different issues, but I have a special interest in relationship difficulties, and they certainly showed up over the course of time. And I kind of fell into the research of it over the years. You know, I started collecting information because I started seeing patterns over and over again. I work with my wife, Victoria. She is uh, in the next office right there. (laughs) Um, She's a clinical social worker as well as a psychoanalyst. And uh, we've been in group practice since uh, 1994. So uh, that's kind of interesting. If I need a little supervision or analysis, I go next door and she comes here. So (laughs) a little additional thing to the love relationship. We've been married for 28 years. Um, We have one son, Bradley, who's 23, interested in becoming a psychologist. I have no responsibility for that. (laughs) Don't tell him I said so, yeah. And uh, so I wrote the book, uh, Learn to Love, Guide to Healing Your Disappointing Love Life, as a guidebook. I wanted something people could read and become a little more conscious of what was going on in their love life experiences, because unfortunately, there's a lot of learning going on that people are not aware of. And that became a problem that I was very focused on, because I think learning has a lot to do with how mental illness takes shape in people's lives unconscious learning. Um, And the family of origin is one of those important intensive classrooms where unconscious learning takes place. So it's a very important problem to solve. Um, I'm also interested in this relentless divorce rate, 50% for first marriages. Watch this, 60% for second marriages, 73% for third marriages. That's outrageous. That's a problem that needs to be fixed, in my opinion. Plus, people are losing faith in marriage. I think that's another problem related to what I've just said that needs to be solved. I happen to believe that what I'm going to talk with you today about is important in trying to correct that divorce rate. Uh, I think a lot of the people that suffer divorce are repeating patterns that end up in this problem. Now, I wouldn't say that if I didn't see it over and over again in the past 34 years. So I'm convinced of this problem. It's interesting you're talking about patterns because um, I was talking with a friend recently. She's just she's getting in the middle of getting divorced and she's very into all the personal development things, you know, and and looking at herself and improving on herself and everything. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about she's got this new partner and she really likes him. And then she's going, but there's all these things. I don't like the way he does this. And it's, I don't like what he does that. And she said, I'm really scared of repeating the same patterns. So, so even though she's aware that she's got patterns, she's then that those patterns then make her afraid of doing other things going into another relationship in case she brings this pattern forward and then it starts another pattern. It's really difficult to break 
a kind a cycle in ourselves, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, even though the first step is consciousness, so I would say there's hope there because she's aware of it. I think she doesn't know what to do after that. Uh, yeah. I think that patterns, when they're unhealthy, they need to be broken. And we need to move in a new direction. There was a, a bit of work done in my profession with a concept called corrective emotional experience back in the 1940s. And I think that's a valuable concept because uh, it basically described how getting an experience different or opposite of the one that you received growing up can offer you a healing opportunity. So I built that idea into the unlearning method I talk about in the book, where there's three steps, becoming aware of patterns that are repeating, repetition indicating that learning has taken place, and then challenging them. Uh, That awareness is a powerful tool. It's not just awareness, knowledge of oneself. It's something that can be applied. In fact, it's most, I happen to believe, it's most important feature is the application. You become aware of something that's unhealthy. You work against it. You disrupt it. Your awareness can challenge the pattern so that you're not allowing the automatic nature of that experience to go on and on and on. The classic example is I sat with a 50-ish year old woman years ago who told me she grew up in a home with an alcoholic, abusive father who uh, physically abused her mother while she and her siblings watched this take place. She married two men who did the same thing to her, and she was working on a third when I saw her. And I asked her, and I remember the look on her face, and that's why it really it's in my memory. I asked her, do you think there's a connection between what happened years ago in your family and the men you're choosing? And she, this is an intelligent, well-educated person. She went, what? She had never considered the connection. And it's examples like that that make me think, wait a minute, there's a little bit of learning that has to take place, a little bit of unlearning, learning, new learning. We're not teaching anything about love life in schools, anywhere. I don't know if you ever heard of this gentleman, but uh, his name was Leo Buscaglia. He was a a doctor of, uh, of education in California back in the 70s, right? Italian fellow, lots of emotion, loved his students, great teacher. One of his female students committed suicide over a love life problem. He was very upset, went to the university, I believe it was Southern California, and said, I have to teach a love class. My students don't understand how to handle the love experience. They overreact. They laughed at him. Leo, don't you have better things to do? He persisted. They gave him a classroom, no credit. He taught it for four years. Standing room only, 100 students. Couldn't fit another in the classroom. What does that tell you? It's interesting you brought that up because I was just going to ask you about that because everything you're saying and that that class that that guy was running, I'm not even going to try and pronounce his name. <laughs> <laughs> I practiced um, about five times. <laughs> yeah. It's really, it's kind of the same as uh, finances. We're not taught money in school or even uh-huh. as we're being brought up, most of us don't, we come out of school and we don't know how to read our bank account. We're not taught uh-huh. how to do interpersonal relationships. We're not right. taught how to, uh, I, I don't want to say analyze ourselves, but kind of look at our behavior and have a look at what we do. And we're not taught how to do that, but really those are the basic skills we need to have a successful life. Yes, and and it's worse for love life. Because when you become an adult, you can get a financial advisor. When you become an adult, you can consult a doctor on a regular basis that tells you about your health, or you can get a trainer. People do this all the time. They work on these areas. Nobody works on their love life. If I stop someone out in the street and say, excuse me, ma'am, what did you learn about love relationships? 
get away from me. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? I'll call a policeman. <laughs> you know, I mean, what did you learn about love relationships? What an important question, because what we learn about love relationships becomes the template, the blueprint to determine love life experience. In my book, I talk about what I, my personal preference in this field of love life psychology, so to speak, is the psychological love life. I named it the psychological love life. The psychological love life is here. It's what you bring with you when you go on a date, when you get married, when you're interested in someone. It's the experience. In your psychological love life, there are three items that I've discovered. Your relationship experiences, the ones that have gotten into your love life, not all of them do. Some do, some don't. What you've learned from them unconsciously is in that psychological love life and after effects if the experiences were unhealthy. And two of the most prominent after effects that I've discovered are defensiveness is one. I don't know what's going on in my love life. I have a lot of disappointment, so I'm a little bit defensive. I either avoid love or I keep a distance in love relationships or I create a lot of conflict, which doesn't allow it to get too close into vulnerabilities and so on. People practice those three quite a bit. And then, of course, one that I know very well, we try to change a love partner. I'll love the hell out of her and make her a good woman. Boy, that guy, I'm going to, he stopped cheating. He's not going to cheat in this relationship. I'm going to love him, make him a better man. And when that, that's one part of it, changing a partner. Another part is multiple substitutions, looking for that perfect partner. That's another way in which people try to solve what they know in an inherent way to be a disappointing love life. So in the book as well, just to give you the three areas, the the unlearning method that I talk about in the book, the psychological uh, love life, and what I like to call the disappointing love life. The disappointing love life has three features as far as I see. One is repetition. We've mentioned that. Repeating things over and over again. That's unhealthy learning, dominating a person's love life experience. And then there's the replication, which is interesting. Uh, This repetition is also replication, meaning something from the past is being replicated over and over and over again. If you've been neglected in early life, which by the way, I want to insert this, that I define the love life as beginning the moment you're born. Any and all relationships involving the emotion of love, past and present. That's your love life. Mother. I collected pictures of babies looking at their mothers. Like, oh, man, this woman, she's, I love you. You know, (laughs) then dad shows up. (laughs) Hey, you're not bad either. Once I've gotten my fill of mom, you know, I'll include you. This is love. This is love. So love's not just romance. And these love relationships we have early in life, they form patterns that can get into our love life experience. So replication takes place. The third one in the disappointing love life is how we recreate these patterns. And that's an issue of learning. So I talk about that in the book as well. But I'll be quiet now. <laughs> no, this, this is great because what you just said about your love relationships aren't just about your romantic partner. That's actually, that changes the whole perspective because it stops you, it, it takes off the blinkers, I suppose. It's uh, actually just uh-huh. focusing on that bit and you need to look at everything, which then, because it's taken the focus off it, it also takes the, the significance out of it as well because you're looking at a whole area as opposed to just one specific thing you know absolutely absolutely and and often enough too often unfortunately the love life experiences that are brought into adulthood occur in that early time in my book i mentioned 12 uh, 10 of them i added two since i've written the book uh abandonment control abuse dependency dishonesty intrusion exploitation, uh, mistrust, 
neglect, rejection, and self-centeredness. These are relationship experiences that I found in my work over the years intrude into people's love lives. They're notorious for coming into our psychological love life and being replicated again and again and again. And what's really tragic is, and this, this is part of why I got into this, is to meet people in their 50s and 60s who have resigned. I don't want anything to do with love. It hurts too much. Wait a minute. You're making that statement without becoming aware of what you've learned about love relationships. That's tragic. If you knew what you've learned and you discovered it was unhealthy, you could go through the process of challenging it, creating the opposite. For example, I grew, and I'll give you myself, which I talk about in the book, uh, the case study. Instead of doing my patients, I give you Tom Jordan, uh, chapter five. I grew up in a home with a mother who never separated from her parents. They lived upstairs. My father worked for my grandfather, an enmeshed family. My mother never left home. She had depressive feelings because of it. She was unhappy. She taught me that eligible women were dependent, controlling, and self-centered. Guess what kind of people I looked for when I left home? And it's worse than that. If I found an independent, not controlling, intimate woman, I imagined she was dependent, controlling, and self-centered. That was my blueprint. I did that from 17 to 35, over and over and over again. I had a disappointing love life. My analyst in, on a couch in the early 90s said, gee, you're using your mother as a template to conduct your love life. What shocked me? I withdrew from dating. I found women to be good friends with, like internships. Let me discover the female mind. I had no sisters, three brothers. My girl friends, not romance, real friends, taught me women can be independent, not controlling or insecure, and intimate, not self-centered. Guess who shows up five years later? Victoria. Independent, not controlling, intimate. We get married. I said, I made a correction. Anybody can do this if the consciousness is there and they go through the steps. It's really interesting. I've got so many questions I want to ask. But I am, that self-awareness is key, isn't it? Because until we can see that there is a pattern in us, and it, but it's also like we might be able to see that there's a pattern, but we don't know why it's there and we also don't have something to replace that pattern because we're human beings we like certainty so we'll just keep recreating that certainty no, no, I, I got the dirty word to give you right now <laughs> familiar <laughs> and you know what the root of familiar is family <laughs> familiar of the family Wow, I didn't even think of that. But yes, so if we get then, like, un- completely unconsciously, we go through our lives recreating our family and our relationships within that family. The ones that get into our love life. Right. And they don't all? This- no. Right, okay. Why is and that? I, I, can't, I can't explain that. Right. Uh, if someone... In my line of work, I like to find out who people are, both present and past. I get a lot of history, look for patterns, uh, understand symptoms, so on. Not all the pat, not all the experiences make it into the love life. Some people grow up in an abusive home, never create that with their children or their spouses. How did that happen? It's wonderful that it does. But I can't explain it, and I won't sit here and say that I know. Uh, Maybe it's a personal choice phenomenon. Maybe it's a 
premature consciousness. <laughs> I have no idea. It's wonderful. <laughs> it's one of those mysteries. Like love itself, love's a mystery, biological, spiritual, psychological, who knows? In my book, in my preface, preface, I say, this is not a book about love. This is a book about love relationships. The relationships we form when we fall in love. That's what I'm interested in. Love, I can't change that. I can't make myself love you. I can't make myself unlove you. That comes from somewhere else. It's beautiful. It's a mystery, human mystery. Even the people that talk about biologic, I don't believe it. They'll, we'll never crack that code. It's wonderful. But the relationship we form when we fall in love, that's something we can do something about. I'm it's full. 50, go ahead. So, and, and fall in love here doesn't isn't just limited to a romantic thing, is it? Because as you were saying, I'm thinking of the baby with the mother. We kind of fall in love, and but it's just that we use the word love to describe a romantic relationship, whereas it's not, is it? It's it's an all anchor any relationship all that we've it. got with somebody. Oh, yes, there's different types of love. So, talk to me about your. And this is a building on that, because you talk about psychological love life. What do you mean by that? I mean the blueprint that we have in our psyche stored there that is fundamentally unconscious that determines our love life experience. It becomes the blueprint that we use to recreate love life experience. Uh, let's break it down. I'm going to break it down to the fundamentals. When, when I talk about what we've learned about love relationships, I take it to another level of analysis. This is a deeper level. Beliefs, behaviors, and feelings. Those are the three areas of experience that define learning. If I learned that women were dependent from my mother, that she was the model. I believe all eligible women are dependent. Even if I never state it, it's in the back room. If you go in with a specific inquiry, people will talk like that. Ah, all men cheat. <laughs> Come on. Doctor, all men cheat. Look the other way, and your man's going to be looking at another skirt. You know that. Belief. Why? Because dad cheated on mom. Uncle Jim cheated on Aunt Mary. Bet you any money. I'll find that. That's why the belief is so strong. It's got passion behind it. It's a belief. With that kind of belief, you stop to worry. Uh-oh, expectations are being shaped. Behavior. It can go in two directions. Looking for women just like my mother or... I can be the dependent one. I can find dependent people. I can be the dependent one. This happens pretty clearly when you're exposed to abuse. You can find abusive partners or you can be abusive yourself. I've had patients that have a, if you look, analyze their love relationships, in some of them they're being abused, in others they're abusing. Going back to being abused, others they're abusing. The abuse experience dominates their psychological love life. That's what's happening. But the behavior can be, as I described, finding people that do that to you or you identified with it and you're doing it to them. Feelings are very interesting because feelings kind of add the color to our love life. I discovered that the feeling that comes with finding dependent partners is depletion, being depleted. Neediness in a relationship is hard on the caregiver. That feeling, if I'm unconscious of it, can be a mocker. This is the kind of partner that's familiar. And if I'm unconscious, bing! right for that person. So, because if something's, and this is building on the same thing here, because I wanted to talk about feelings too. I've never really thought that 
or, or never considered that, you know, the way our feelings can actually be a guide to looking at those other markers, the beliefs and things that, that are going on, because quite often our beliefs are just the way the world is. We don't even see, we're not even aware that we have them, are we? Right, right. And uh, the world can be the family of origin. You know, I I have a disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> So that my mother doesn't start rattling up in heaven. You know? <laughs> she could send a little lightning bolt yep. down. You know? <laughs> my screen goes black. Uh oh. <laughs> Mom's not happy. I love my mother. Mm. I loved my mother. My mother's no longer with us. She was a, a person who was, and I talk about this in my acknowledgments, she was a person who was very interested in her psychological experience, I'll say. Not to the extent she should have been, but. She was interested. The family of origin is a very intensive classroom. It teaches us at a time of great vulnerability. We're children. We're adolescents, young adults. That teaching goes right into the soul. It goes very deep. It becomes familiar as we've talked about it. I have deep respect for the family of origin. Um, in the 20th century, we were very careful about messing with the family of origin. In our courtrooms, we were careful. Handling child abuse cases, we were careful. Domestic violence cases, we were careful. We didn't want to disturb that sacred place. I still feel it's sacred, but it must come under analysis if we're going to grow, if we're going to learn. I love my mother and that love includes understanding what she taught me that's not healthy. Because I know my mother, my father too, would want me to become the best man I can become in my life. So I have to crack the codes of learning that have occurred in my life. So I think in the 21st century, we've become a little more interested in the family of origin as a source of influence, as a source of learning. I happen to believe, and this is on the cutting edge of my current work, because the love life area that I've been working on, and I mentioned this in the book, never stops evolving. I've said this to Victoria a number of times. She's sick of hearing it. I say, Vicki, I've reorganized everything I, I believe <laughs> once again. Do I have to hear it one more time? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's in the marital contract, Victoria. <laughs> so, but the evolution is very interesting. The place I'm at now is that the love relationship, I'll give you a preview. The love relationship is more central to the creation of mental illness than we now think it is. In other words, relationships can cause illness. We know that. But the love relationship, defined as we just defined it a few minutes back, that's lethal when it's unhealthy. Because that familiar, that familiarity can stay lodged in our unconscious recreating these patterns for a lifetime. That's how powerful it is. So I think we really have to start thinking a little bit more about how these early love relationships, love relationships in general, can be both healing as well as traumatic. Traumatic vis-a-vis -vis our love life experience. Because if they're unhealthy, if what we learn is unhealthy, and we're recreating that over and over again, even though we experience extreme disappointment, divorce, suffering in many instances, and yet we're replicating the same thing over and over again, that's a problem. As you're talking, a particular friend of mine is coming up and she didn't have a happy childhood. She was sexually abused by one of the teachers. There was a, a teacher at the school she was at who, you know, came out 30 years later that he'd abused all these kids. And she's quite obviously very unhappy, but she's having known her for a number of years now and having had many conversations with her, while she knows she's unhappy, she also 
enjoys that familiarity of being in that same space. And that's another, that's another, because it's how do you recognize it? Well, there's two sides of it, I suppose. You, you might recognize what's going on, but you also might not want to do anything about it. Yeah. Why? I, well, if, if she was sitting in my office, I think the loaded word is enjoyed. Enjoys. Uh, yeah. That's the word I would put the magnifying glass on. And I would start asking questions about it. Enjoy in what way? How so? Even when it hurts you? Hmm. And can we dissect that word enjoy and start to look at the various parts of it and differentiate experiences of attachment from experiences of unhealthy replication that are taking place? Let's... Let's get complicated, I would offer her. Let's get complicated. Let's start to move things in different categories and say, that enjoyment's not all peachy cream. It's also a problem. And let's dissect the problem out and isolate the problem. So the enjoyment can be a little bit better for you. Uncontaminated. Look at this lump of something bad. <laughs> you thought I was going to say a bad word. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I was. <laughs> but uh, children might be watching. <laughs> so uh, let's analyze this. So you encourage a person to look at their love life the, in a con- with that powerful consciousness tool that can differentiate, that can discriminate, that can, can put things in compartments for a while can enter into what I like to call therapeutic conflict, what I've learned versus what I'm learning. Wait a minute. What I'm learning says what I've learned is unhealthy. Uh Uh-oh, I have a problem. I'm attached to what I've learned, but I believe that what she's telling me about my love life, it's unhealthy. That's a conflict. But it's a therapeutic one because it describes the initial stage of change that takes place psychologically for for human beings, entering into conflict at the beginning as we turn over this learning that we've obtained from our families, that first stage of conflict is very important. It's uncomfortable too. Nobody likes to question the family of origin. Oh, man, yeah, I'm starting to feel guilt, doctor. You're talking a lot about mom's teachings. <laughs> okay, I got one for you. You're really pulling out the good stuff. I don't know. Your interview technique is working on me, <laughs> Karen. I'm going to complain to my publicist. This is a problem. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here we go. All right, ready. 1962, I'm sitting having waffles with my father and mother, 1962, and Sunday morning, we're having waffles, and the waffle iron is going, mom's serving them, dad's making them, me and my two older brothers are sitting, youngest wasn't born yet, we're sitting at the table, dad gets philosophical. I hope you guys find someone like your mom to marry one of these days. You know, she was a virgin when I married her. (laughs) You know, he didn't he didn't say any more. Like virginity might be immaturity, Dad. <laughs> like, you don't want me to marry someone below the age of well, but that's instruction. One of the ways in which love life learning takes place in the family. There are three. There's relationship. If I form a relationship with someone. That relationship can be the, the petri dish that teaches love relations. Also, observation, that's a big one. Children can observe the parental relationship and see how it works out, or the uncle and aunt, the, the older brother and, and his wife or girlfriend, and learn quite a bit from that. And in some cases, instruction. You know, when I was I put instruction into the book. I, I couldn't think of an example, and boom, the next morning, (laughs) that one shows up, like the unconscious said to me, hey, you want an example? Here, remember this. Wow. 
Okay. <laughs> That's instruction. And uh, it can be very unconscious too, because I don't think children necessarily have the consciousness to ask questions, inquire. Hey, Dad, what do you mean by that? Say some more. Like, what is this? Is there a problem with what you're talking about? And so on. No. So it's fundamentally unconscious. I'm chuckling as well about the fact that you said your dad got all philosophical. (laughs) (laughs) He was teaching about love. Not exactly what Leo Buscaglia had in mind, but you know what I mean? (laughs) 1950s version, maybe. <clears throat> it's, yeah. So I'm moving on from or, or building on that. Your dad would have thought that was the best thing he could have said to you. So yeah. then you go out into the world and you I know you talk in the book about disappointing love life, but how do you figure you've got a disappointing love life? Because most of us, you know, your dad would have thought is love, that's his perfect idea of. A love life, his perfect love life, you know? Uh, That (laughs) one didn't get into my love life, by the way. (laughs) Glad to hear it. And you could say, why? (laughs) Well, because for some reason, as an older teenager, I became, I guess it was the sexual revolution as well at that time. And I, and women's liberation was taking place. And I was, I was learning outside my family quite a bit in my early twenties and so on graduate school, so on. So I think that one there didn't make it in. But I'm sorry, your question. I I wanted to clear that up. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. Disappointing love life. because And I was coming at it from a couple of different angles. Your dad probably thought that was his ideal love life and wanted to pass it on. But also, how are we aware that there is something more? Well, two sides of it. Something more than this or that we've actually... How do we recognize that it's disappointing? Uh, Repetition is disappointing. Disappointments add up. They accumulate. There's a certain emotional feeling part to the word disappointment. And You know, it's interesting about the word disappointment. I love language. Language has levels. You're appointing someone. You're making an appointment. I appoint you to love me. If you don't love me, I'm disappointed. So in a sense, we're picking someone. We're making an appointment. Why we make an appointment with this person versus this one and that one is an interesting question. We is a psychology to it. But if you add up disappointments upon disappointments, you get to what I call in the book resignation. Resignation is the accumulation of unhappy experiences, disappointments, to the point where I'm going to defend against the hurt that disappointments create. I'm going to leave love alone, or I'm going to have a limited love relationship, or maybe I'll substitute it with just sex. But the point is, it's too hurtful. And people will get to resignation sometimes after several disappointments. Some people linger in the love life world for many disappointments before they reach resignation. Others reach resignation with age. I'm 50 years old now. I'm going to change my expectations. Love is not in the cards for me. I wrote, I have a blog, uh, lovelifelearningcenter.com. I put it up in 2012. I wanted it to be an online library of real articles that people could read talking about the real stuff. You know, should I bring my child's father to court for child care? How do I live without love in my life? That was a a post I wrote a while back that's gone through a few revisions because of some of the posts I write, eh, they have a little bit of a reaction, my, my community, so to speak, but some have big, and that one was a tsunami. And I read all the commentary. Some people scolded me. I don't like this part of the article. I made changes. I can learn. I made changes. It's in its third revision. It's an article about if you get to resignation, what I offer people in resignation is two things. If you believe that love relationships are learned, there's hope. 
because if you become aware of learning, you can unlearn. Number two is a little funny formula that I've been staring at over the years in the love life area. If you give love, love comes back. It's like one of those balls on that paddle. It comes back. Now, the hard part is giving love when you don't feel like you have any. But we human beings, we have love even when we're not being given love. And that's a wonderful realization to have. When you have that realization and you're in resignation and you say to yourself, okay, I don't have the love that I always thought I would have. Let me go out into the world and give love. Let me find ways of giving love. Love comes back. It's very interesting when it happens. I pay close attention. And it doesn't always come back in the way you expect either, does it? No, nope. no control. <laughs> love, love's got a mind of its own. Yeah. And look at the language. We fall in love. Ah. <laughs> uh, it's not, we go into love. <laughs> we walked into love. I walked into love with my wife. I chose to love Victoria. I fell in love. And you know when it was? During a job interview. I ran a clinic in Queens, New York, a psychiatric clinic. A young man. My wife showed up for a job. I fell in love with her. But it was so scary for me because I was too young, just out of graduate school. I wasn't ready to settle down. Six years passed <laughs> before we reconnected and got married shortly after. <laughs> How about that? Love in the back room somewhere. You know? I took love. I felt love. I put it in a box. I wrapped it with rope and a big knot, and I put it in the closet. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode where I was talking to Dr. Thomas Jordan. Part two will be next week, so make sure you tune in. Thanks for joining us this week on Menopause, Marriage and Motherhood. Make sure you subscribe to the show on your favorite player. And while you're at it, we'd love you to leave us a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would be amazing too. Be sure to tune in next week for the next episode. And remember, if you're busy thinking about what you can't have, how on earth are you going to enjoy what you can have? See you next week.